This is CBC Here and Now. The city of St. John's is losing another heritage building. I'm live at City Hall. I have all the details coming up. There will never be enough time given to them to justify Hannah's death. She lost her daughter to street racing tonight. She's calling for the stiffest sentence possible. You shouldn't need the police to tell you that it's a dangerous thing to be driving at 140 kilometers an hour. A local insurance company sends a strong message to customers and Double O what? Why potential politician Chess Crosby wants to be Sean Connery. Well, I have some double digits for you. How about two zero? That's the temperature for most of the island tomorrow. Even warmer with the Humidex. Details are coming up. Well, tomorrow is voting day in towns and cities across the province. And in most communities, people will fill out their ballots in the traditional way, in person at a voting station. Yeah, but in St. John's, questions about the city's mail-in voting system have some people talking about a third option, online voting. Here now's Mark Quinn explores that idea. The biggest gumshoe in my mouth in the whole city of St. John's can't vote. What is going on here? Some residents who didn't receive a mail-in ballot are frustrated. And they have to physically get off the couch and go somewhere to vote. They have to make a phone call. You know, they, it's going to be made difficult for them. And what we need to do is make voting easy for people, not harder. At City Hall, the mayor is defending the mail-in ballot system and also opening the door to change. And the mail-in ballot works. The, in fact, I'd go one step further and, and go on to online voting in order to to get more voters. On social media, people responded to this question positively and negatively. One said, young people want the convenience of voting online. Another points to a jurisdiction where it's already happening. It worked well last fall during the Nova Scotia election. But still others are strongly against online voting. Absolutely not. Not transparent. Easy to rig, hack. No way to audit. Newfoundland and Labrador's Privacy Commissioner believes online voting is inevitable, but warns it must be done properly. Your anonymity is pre preserved, but also that the votes are verifiable. We don't want people casting uh, 100 votes because they've hacked the system. But first things first, the deadline to mail-in votes in this fall's municipal election has passed. But St. John's residents can still drop off ballots at City Hall or vote in person here or at a station in their ward tomorrow. Mark Quinn, CBC News, St. John's. Staying with Council, another heritage building will soon be dust. St. John's City Council has just made a decision on the fate of Waterford Manor in the West End. Here now is Jeremy Eaton is at City Hall with the latest. So Jeremy, what can you tell us? Well, Council just wrapped up their uh, weekly meeting and they did vote in favour of issuing a demolition order to the owner of the Waterford Manor there on Waterford Bridge Road, meaning the owners of the property have to tear it down. Now, this story all begins last summer in July of 2016 when the Waterford Manor caught on fire. Now, at the time, there were reports of explosions inside of that building. Now, this was brought forward... Now, this story, sorry, took a turn when one of the co-owners of the property was charged with arson this past June. Now, this was brought forward to council by Councillor Tilly, who called it an eyesore and said that the whole inside has been gutted and that it needs to go. Now, this building was built in 1905, according to Councillor Tilly, by a man named Liam Butler. In 2006, it became a heritage building, but Councillor Tilly told me after the meeting that every day he's gotten, every day in the last year, he's gotten a call from a resident saying that that building needs to go. And tonight, council voted for that with the exceptions of three councillors who voted against it and that's councillor Sheila O'Leary, councillor Sandy Hickman and councillor Dave Lane. So what this order means is that the owner of the Waterford Manor will have to demolish it and if they don't well then it's going to fall to the city meaning that taxpayers could be on the hook for tearing down another heritage building. Reporting live in St. John's I'm Jeremy Eaton for Here and Now. 
Some big developments today in a deadly street racing case that's been making headlines in this province for more than a year. The man at the wheel of the pickup that killed Hannah Thorne of New Harbor pleaded guilty today. His co-accused, however, added a new twist to this drawn-out legal affair. Here now is Terry Roberts has more. It was the afternoon of July 7th, 2016. The New Harbor Barrens, right where this roadside memorial now sits. Hannah Thorne, a recent high school grad in the passenger seat, her elderly grandmother behind the wheel. A Ford pickup driven by Brian King smashed head on into their little Hyundai. An explosion of steel, glass, and broken bodies. Hannah Thorne died. Gertie Thorne, then 81, seriously injured. Charges of street racing against these two men followed. Every court appearance filled with tension. Symbols of support for Hannah. Both men pleading not guilty. Painful trials just days away. Will that all change this morning in a Harbor Grace courtroom? Brian King pleading guilty to three charges, including dangerous operation of a vehicle causing death. He could be sentenced November 16th. Gail Thorne is calling for the stiffest possible sentence. I'm glad we don't have to sit in the room with a room full of despicable people. I'm hoping actually that uh, the judge will want more than they're asking for. There'll never be enough time given to them to justify Hannah's death. He killed my daughter senselessly. The accident did not have to happen. They broke the law terribly. But co-accused Stephen Mercer of Upper Island Cove threw a new twist on things today, electing to be tried by judge alone at Supreme Court, further delaying the process. Gail Thorne says it's been an excruciatingly painful 14 months. Made worse, she says, by the fact there's never been any signs of remorse or apologies issued. So what would Hannah Thorne be doing if she didn't die that day? Studying year two of her office administration studies. Terry Roberts, CBC News, St. John's. Well, the recent deaths on the highways in this province and a crackdown on speeders has a lot of people talking and it has one insurance company writing clients. Redwood Insurance says if you're one of the people nabbed for going 140 kilometers an hour, it doesn't want you as a customer. You shouldn't need the police to tell you that it's a dangerous thing to be driving at 140 kilometers an hour. So uh, I just want to send out a strong message and get some people's attention, get them thinking about the impact of that speed and to let our good clients know who actually drive responsibly that we're going to do our best to try and see if we can avoid having their insurance rates being driven up because of accidents caused by speeding drivers. In, in, in this letter you're basically saying that if you're someone who drives 140 you don't want them to be one of your clients. Yes. Are you actually taking any concrete steps? Are you going to be saying to clients look we don't want to cover you anymore or when there are well, new applications? We have to provide coverage and quotes to people because insurance is a mandatory product. But there is a, uh, a, a pool called Facility Association where high-risk high drivers go. So there's a whole bunch of underwriting rules and regulations we have to follow. But in cases where people meet the criteria to be in facility, we're going to make sure they go there. We're not going to be looking for accommodations for insurance companies or anything like that because we really feel we've got to be sending a message to these drivers that there's a price to be paid for those kind of driving behaviors. You talked about the emotional impact. You're dealing with, the cl with you know, people who may be family members of those who've been killed in accidents. Yeah. But from the business side of things, isn't this also motivated by the fact that obviously any insurance company wants to have the best drivers, that, that yeah. stereotypical little old lady who only drives to church on Sundays because they don't get into accidents yeah. and they're more profitable for the companies as well. Well, sure, that's always, you know, a business factor. But in a case like this, I mean, really insurance goes out the window when you're talking to someone on the phone and they're distraught because they've just lost a family member. That's the last thing that our staff is thinking about. You know, a lot of our clients we've had for like 20, 30 years, we've been in business a long time. They're almost like friends and family to us, so that's like the last thing we're actually thinking about in these kind of situations. Do you think this will change people's behavior? Well, I think it's going to take a lot more than a, a letter to clients, but at least if we got a bit of a discussion started, and we've got so much feedback from our clients today, 
the 99.9% percent of it is just overwhelmingly positive and saying thank you for saying this and you know people it's almost like there's an underlying frustration that's built up in the public with the uh, the way people are driving so if that has like a little impact and, and one person maybe doesn't speed tomorrow or might have uh, done it you know we will we'll have accomplished our goal. The province's privacy commissioner is echoing national concerns over an American law that states U.S. Customs officers can now look at your mobile device, even demand your passwords. To better guard government employees against potential privacy breaches at the border, Donovan Malloy has this advice. We're recommending that they not take those devices with them when they're crossing the U.S. border and or implement other measures such as backing up the information on hard drives, leaving those in Canada, you know, different things that can be done, perhaps issuing clean laptops and devices to employees just while they're traveling. I caution strongly against obstructing the uh, border officials because it's likely to get you arrested or worse. Uh, you know, don't lie, cooperate, but at the end of the day, realize that unless you, if you're demanded to give access to your device to provide your passwords, if you refuse to do it, you're likely going to be turned away. Well, here's some news for foodies. The star of CNN's Anthony Bourdain, Parts Unknown, is rumored to have popped up in this province. The restaurant industry is abuzz with news that he may be off moose hunting right now. He said to be here thanks to an invitation from Raymond's Restaurant, but people are being tight-lipped about exactly where he's visiting and what he's doing. Bourdain scar scored some points with some people when he went to bat for the Canadian seal hunt back in 2013. Bourdain said boycotting the industry could doom Inuit communities. We're hearing that he's got a film crew with him. Wow, people are pretty excited to see what Anthony Bourdain is going to uh, film a video while he's here. And of course, uh, he's probably going to try out some authentic Newfoundland food, but is he going to get some uh, authentic Newfoundland weather? <laughs> Carolyn is here, as you can see. Ryan is off tonight. So what does it look like, Carolyn? Well, I would certainly say it's kind of unusual weather tomorrow in, ter in the sense that we're getting some really nice summer-like temperatures tomorrow. When I was speaking with Environment Canada, they described it as the last blast of summer <laughs> for the foreseeable future. So if you're on the island, you want to get out and enjoy it. But this is how things are looking right now. We have some light rain that's moving moving into Labrador City, some heavy cloud cover, and uh, you can see some precipitation here moving towards the Northern Peninsula. And there is a big system that is moving uh, towards the province tonight. It's gonna bring with it lots of rain in Labrador City, Happy Valley, Goose Bay, looking at about five to 10 millimeters of rain. And that system is gonna move down to the island. The northeast, uh, northeastern parts of the island will see about uh, 10 to 15 millimeters of rain tonight. And we could get some of that here in the uh, in the Avalon, but we'll get the, the least amount of uh, rain overnight tonight. So these are some of the lows that we're looking at. It's going to start off fairly chilly with a chance of showers for St. John's Metro and uh, the Buren Peninsula, 10 degrees uh, early, early morning tomorrow and double digits here for the rest of the island. But that is going to change for much of the island tomorrow. Things are going to warm up way up 20 degrees, 25 with the Humidex. I'll tell you all about it a little bit later. Debbie. Thanks, Carolyn. Well, big news out of Canada's entertainment industry tonight, and it involves a Newfoundlander. After more than a decade, Rick Mercer says it's time to close the curtain on his show. The Rick Mercer Report will launch its 15th and final season tomorrow night on CBC TV. And Mercer made the announcement in a way that he's famous for, a rant. Hello everyone, Rick Mercer here. Look at me, I'm back in the alley. That can only mean one thing. We are preparing a brand new season of the Mercer Report. This alley is where I come to think. This is where I come to rant. And quite frankly, with the state of the world right now, my only concern this season is that once I start ranting, I won't be able to stop. If you can believe it, this will be the 15th season of the show. And sure, it has evolved over the years, but one thing that has always remained consistent is this. I've always known I have the best job in the country. It has been a huge privilege to be invited into your home every single week. I can't tell you how much fun it's been. So yes, this is the 15th season of the Mercer Report. It is also the final season. 
What's next? I have no idea. What I do know is we have been hard at work preparing what I think will be our greatest season yet. We have just returned from an epic road trip. A lot of people say coast to coast to coast at the Mercer Report. We mean it. We've been to the Pacific. We've been to the Atlantic. We went to the Arctic Circle. I was swimming in the Arctic Ocean. I've helped paint a grain elevator on the prairies. I've dangled off the Confederation Bridge to PEI. I have been on an intimate adventure with Jan Arden. I have been covered head to toe in peanut butter and licked clean by 32 golden retrievers. And why? Because when you get an invitation like that, you show up. I love my job. I always have. I want to thank everyone who's ever watched and please continue to do so. The Mercer Report, as always, CBC Television, Tuesdays at 8, 8.30 in Newfoundland and Labrador, a place where I'll be spending a lot more time in the future. Well, uh, as you can imagine, a lot of thought must have gone into that decision in about 15 minutes. I'll speak with Rick about just how tough it was and what's next. Documenting the story of humpback whales one picture at a time. And later, yoga class, kitty cat style. You're not going to want to miss this story. Welcome back to Here and Now. Well, it's been a difficult summer for the endangered right whale. 
More than a dozen were killed, some by ship strikes, and the search is on for how to prevent more deaths. But whale experts say they are not the only species endangered by ship strikes. The gentle giants, humpbacks, are also at risk. Now, the North Atlantic humpback, humpback migrates northward from the Caribbean in the spring along the east coast of the U.S. and Canada. The planet's largest gathering of humpback whales is found off this province from June to September. The research group Allied Whale out of Bar Harbor, Maine, says 50 have died in the Gulf of Maine over the past two years. Eleven of them were hit by vessels. While humpback numbers seem relatively healthy, Allied Whale is collecting as much information as it can to understand migration patterns and threats to the population. In this province, citizen scientists armed with cameras are doing their best to help. As Jane Aidy reports, they're tracking humpback stories one photograph at a time. Trinity, Newfoundland offers tourists some spectacular scenery on land. But it's the scenery on the ocean that really wows a crowd. He's acting up well. There's two, three. There's three in a group further up. Yeah, oh, man. Oh. Nice. Oh, my God. What a nice white little belly. That's Chris Prince with the commentary. He's been bringing tourists out on the water for these kinds of experiences for 20 years. It's a dream job. It really is, yeah. I never worked a day in my life at it. <laughs> it's always, uh, you know, just such an exciting feeling just to be out on the water and to get around them and uh, see the whales so happy feeding and then putting off the shoals breaching and tail breaching and just never get tired of it. She's a Chris and his wife Shauna own Sea of Wales Whale Tours in Trinity. They help tourists capture photos of a lifetime, but they're also keen on taking their own snaps to capture whale tails. Each animal can be identified by the unique black and white pattern on the underside of their tails. Come on! Oh yeah! Oh yeah! That's an old breacher Perfect. from way back. I remember that tail core, remember that one? Yeah. <laughs> it's been around for about four weeks. Four weeks, yeah. Oh, that's cool. oh, could be and I remember feet. one time we had it uh, breach over uh, 100 times in three hours off Catalina. Oh yeah, what a good one, Reg. Oh, that's great. I think that's the first. Chris compares uh, his tail shots with Reg Kempen's. Kempen is from England. He came to Trinity to whale watch 20 years ago and got hooked. He's been back every summer since. It seemed to me anyway, it was really just a waste of time to come out on these trips, take loads of pictures, take them home, show them to people, and then never look at them again. So Reg, Chris, and Shauna started a catalogue of whale tails. When you look at that, tell me, do you not see the head of a bald eagle on the right-hand side? <laughs> oh, I do see it. Hey. So here's the eye of the eagle and the beak, and then the back of the head. Together, they've identified 800 individuals that feed in Trinity Bay. They share and compare their findings with a group called Allied Whale, based in the Gulf of Maine. Allied Whale has been collecting whale tail photos since the 1970s. It's um, really a thrill for us when we make a match on an animal that hasn't been sighted in a very, very long time. Just looking at like their life history. So one of our biggest success stories was finding that one in 1974, or that hadn't been seen since 1974. And that was a few years back. And so, you know, when you have an animal that's been out there all this time, I mean, they don't go and hide somewhere, that no one has seen that animal since then. And the last time it had been seen was off the coast of Puerto Rico. Out of the 800, I would guess we've got pretty decent history on 250, 300 of them. And some of that history goes back 20, 30, and in that one great case, 40 years. There he is. There are citizen scientists all over the East Coast sharing their humpback photos with Allied Whale. Deb Young takes hers in Whitless Bay. She has records on about a thousand humpbacks. I think we are important. I mean, the scientific community are, are finding out that, yes, we're not trained in this, but logic 
tells you how to do this and what you're looking for and uh, with the right whales, with, with sharks, with anything in the sea at this point. You need to see how the creatures are doing. If, if they're not doing well, then we're not going to do well. I mean, it's, it's kind of our temperature, isn't it? Yeah! Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> wow! Right now, the North Atlantic humpback population is somewhere around 22,000 animals. About 5,600 of them spend their summers in Canadian waters. And citizen scientists here have got their tails and their backs. I think it's important that we know how the population is doing, where they're going. Um, unusual, we've had a very unusual year where things came late. We normally see four to five mom and calf pairs and we've only seen one. So that's a little concerning. I don't know if they've just found a better place to feed or if they're just not having as many calves. I don't you know, we don't know. There's, there's so many more questions that we, you know, that we don't have answers to. But this is the only way we can try to, to find out. Oh. Jane Aidy, CBC News, Whitless Bay. An end to ranting. Rick Mercer says his popular TV show is about to come to an end.
This weather update is brought to you by the Take Charge Business Efficiency Program. Over 400 businesses have saved energy and taken charge of their bottom line. Find out how you can too. Welcome back to Here Now. Carolyn, you're promising some nice weather. Funny how those summer revivals never seem to come on the weekends. Except for Saturday. Saturday was nice. I went out and I was walking around downtown, checked out the doors open, lots yeah. of different places. So it was a great day for that. But then yesterday, mm, not yeah, so much. It was... wasn't that bad. <laughs> <laughs> I was out for a walk last it night. It is the end of September. Really nice. you know. yeah. Yeah, so we are getting some nice temperatures tomorrow, but it's not going to last. So mm. if you're able to get out and enjoy it whatsoever tomorrow, try to do it. Uh, let's have a look at our highs for today. Today was a pretty decent day on the island as well. We're seeing lots of double digit temperatures in the mid teens, even 18 there in Cape Race. Much cooler though in Labrador. You have some northerly winds coming down there that are keeping things really, really cool. Just seven degrees as the high today in Nain. So this is what's on the way. As I mentioned, we have some summer summer temperatures uh, on the way for the island tomorrow. A rain snow mix for much of Labrador later in the week. And we're also keeping an eye on Maria. Not looking like we're going to feel any of Maria, uh, but we're still going to keep an eye on it. So this is what's going to be moving in tonight. We have a system moving across Labrador towards the island, bringing about 5 to 15 millimeters of rain. Uh, the Avalon Peninsula and the southern parts of the island will be largely spared, only about 2 to 4 millimeters expected there so that'll be overnight tonight and into tomorrow morning but things should start to clear off so we're looking at 10 degrees uh, overnight tonight as the low in St. John's and similar temperatures right across the island in the upper single digits with lots of showers there lots of showers as well in Labrador Nain just two degrees should stay drier in Nain than other areas in Labrador so tomorrow much of this is going to move off you can see things are clear off nicely in Labrador, but those winds, those northerly winds are going to keep things very, very cool. And you can see a change in wind direction here. All of these arrows coming up mean that it's going to be a nice southwesterly wind, and that's what's going to warm things up for us tomorrow. So those showers will move off. We could see some of it in the morning, but by the afternoon, we should get a little break from it and some nice warm temperatures and a mix of sun and clouds. So here it is, 12 degrees to start the day with uh, some showers, about two to four millimeters in St. John's. It will be very breezy. The wind will be warm, but it will be strong, about 40 to 70 kilometers uh, tomorrow. The winds are expected to reach. So there's that 20 degree temperature. 25 is going to feel like with the humidex. So some sun and cloud in the afternoon there. But then we have some more showers that will be moving in in the evening hours and they'll go down to about 18 degrees. So this is what we're looking at for the whole island tomorrow. Some really, really nice temperatures for pretty much everyone in the upper, upper teens. Uh, but you can see lots of uh, chances for showers throughout the day tomorrow. Like, like St. John's, things will start to clear off kind of in the morning, get a bit of a break and then you could see some more uh, showers a little bit later. So same same thing for Labrador, Lab City, Churchill Falls. Those showers will move off in the morning and then you're going to be largely a cloudy day there, but temperatures much cooler in the mid to upper single digits there. So uh, Things are going to be taking a turn for pretty much everyone uh, come Wednesday. I'll have all those details coming up a bit later. Well, nothing lasts forever, and that includes the Rick Mercer Report. Rick broke the news today that this season will be the last for the popular program, which airs on CBC TV Tuesday nights. But after 15 seasons, Rick will sign off next March. So why is he pulling the plug? Let's put that to Rick, who is joining us from Toronto. It's great to have you here, but why are you taking the show off the air at the end of this season? I guess the short answer is I don't exactly know, or at least I don't have a good answer. I always thought that it, the decision would be made for me. That's how things in TV usually end. They usually end badly. And I always thought uh, I would stop when I stopped having fun or viewers stopped tuning in or we ran out of stories to do. And uh, none of those things have happened. It's still very much the best job that I could ever imagine. Uh, I still love going to work every single day. I just think that uh, in TV, terms, we've had an extremely long run. Uh, when we wrap it up, it'll be 15 years, almost unheard of, and so it's time to uh, see what is next. 
Well, before I get to what is potentially ahead for you, you have said you were living a bucket list life with this show. You've just said yeah. it was the best. Um, can you quantify that a little bit or qualify it? What, what was the ride like? I don't know if it was uh, my bucket list, for example, but I've lived a lot of other people's bucket lists. <laughs> you know, I've jumped out of a plane three times in my life. That's on a lot of people's bucket list. True. It's not on mine. Never has been. <laughs> three times I jumped out of those suckers. Uh, I, the chances of me ever doing so again, very slim. But I have been very fortunate. I've got to meet so many people. I've got to travel the country in ways that I never, ever thought possible. You know, when I was a kid, I used to, there was a guy up the street who used to go away on business trips. And I would think, wow, like he goes away on the plane for work? Like, who does that? And I've got to live that life in a very exciting way. Uh, just in the last 15 days, I've been coast to coast to coast. Literally, lots of people say that, but I have. I've been to the Pacific, I've been to the Atlantic, and I've been in the Arctic Ocean. So to be able to do that on a regular basis, it's been a huge privilege, and uh, it's, it's something that uh, I really, it may sound cliche, but I've loved every minute. So what is the head? <laughs> I wish I knew. I always wanted to be in TV. I was one of those people when I was a kid. Uh, I would, if someone wanted to be, you know, a doctor or a firefighter, I think, why? Why when there's TV? You know, <laughs> look, it's the most exciting thing ever. I don't, I don't know if I feel that same way now, but once I got into TV, I wanted my own show, and, and I've had that for 14 years now. And if, if you offered me a show for next year, and I said yes, and if you said, what will it be, I would describe the show that I'm doing now. It's the show that I love to do, and so honestly, I don't know what is next, but you know, I've always gone to work in the morning, so I, I will imagine I'll continue to do so. You and Jan Arden had some fabulous chemistry on the air. Maybe you'll, you two will team up. It has been suggested. I don't know if she could take it, <laughs> or if I could take it. Uh, it's, uh, it. It's been one of the pleasant uh, surprises of the TV show that I've certainly made friends that uh, I never thought I would make, and Jan is certainly one of them. And, uh, and uh, you know, I've been threatening to bring her to Newfoundland very, for a very long time, so maybe that'll happen. And we all know your penchant for politics. You know there are two provincial parties here looking for leaders. <laughs> yes, I saw that. <laughs> Not tempted. <laughs> <laughs> Not in the least, <laughs> but thank you. Yeah, you will be spending more time home, I understand. Uh, but as I said, you love politics. Maybe we're going to see some sightings of you off in some alley off Water Street, ranting to no one in particular. St. John's certainly has good alleys. <laughs> I remember when we went to Halifax, Halifax to do 22 minutes, and I was like, okay, I want to rant in an alley. And they were like, we don't have any. And I was like, what kind of place is this? They don't have alleys. And they actually don't. It's odd. That's why I went to the harbor front to rant there. But uh, yeah, certainly back in St. John's, there's no shortage. Rick, thanks so much for joining us. Best of the uh, season to you, what lies ahead. And uh, good luck. Thanks very much, Debbie. Double O what? Why potential politician Chess Crosby wants to be like Sean Connery.
Welcome back to Here and Now. You might recall my conversation with Tory MHA Steve Kent. He's packing it in and heading to Mount Pearl to take over there as city manager. So Kent's departure will trigger a by-election in the district of Mount Pearl North. And the only person to express interest to lead the Conservatives is well-known lawyer Chess Crosby, although so far he has simply been testing the waters. Uh, good evening, sir. Howdy, Anthony. As you know, there'll be a by-election. What better way to show people that you're serious about being a Conservative leader than the saying, okay, I'm in the by-election? You got a point, but I figure there's a better way to show people I'm serious about being leader, and that's concentrate on the leadership if I decide to throw my hat in. So what does that mean? Well, what it means is that running in a by-election for a seat in the House of Assembly requires someone's full time and attention. It's a serious effort that has to be mounted, and the people of that district deserve your full attention. If uh, someone like myself is going after the leadership, then that deserves full-time care and attention. So I don't think it's a smart thing to do, and I don't think people would appreciate it if you divided your attention. Is that because you don't actually want to run in Mount Pearl? Um, I'd uh, run, you know, in a lot of different places uh, if they'd have me. And uh, I actually had a conversation with Steve, who himself raised the question, was I interested in running there? Uh, but I just told you what my attitude is. I think if you're doing the job of running for leader, then you really need to spend your time doing that job and give okay. it all your, your attention. So you won't be running in that by-election? No. Okay. Good to get that out of the way. Uh, you've been traveling across the province, district to district. You also have a website, and you've uh, posted many videos to that website. Some of them talk about your position on uh, the need for an audit of Muskrat Falls or some heavy-duty policy. But I want to take a look at one of them that caught my attention because it doesn't really have to do with policy. Let's take a look. The best thing about living in Newfoundland and Labrador is those days when the sun shines, the wind is calm, the weather is mild and warm, and you forget all about the days when it wasn't. So, so do I take it from that, Mr. Crosby, that you're only happy here about 20 days of the year? Well, look, uh, this last uh, summer, uh, there have been many happy days like that, right? Mm -hmm. I'm talking about in the fall when people go moose hunting and the weather is starting to turn cold. Uh, but you get those nice crisp days when it's sunny, maybe so it's heard. 15 degrees. Uh, you know, you what's can... the point of a video like that? What's the point? Yeah. Well, I, I guess, you know, people know of me generally. I have a fairly high uh, name recognition. Uh, but they don't really know me as other than a lawyer. And so the point of this is to uh, show people a side of me that most people wouldn't know about. All right, well, let's take a look at another side of you that I think it's fair to say most people don't know about. Let's take a look. Since I was a kid, I wanted to be a secret agent. The best James Bond was the original actor, Sean Connery. He did it the best, as far as I'm concerned, in uh, movies like From Russia With Love, Goldfinger, Dr. No. I would like to play James Bond in those movies, but I'd also like to look like Sean Connery. <laughs> All right, so you, you want to look like Sean Connery? I don't know any plastic surgeons that good, okay? <laughs> but, but again, the idea here is to so, show that you're not um, like a legal fuddy-duddy. What, what's the idea? Yeah. Pretty much that? Pretty much. You've obviously been doing your homework. Well, a little bit. You know, we're supposed to do that in our business. Mm -hmm. but, but here's the tough question, and I hope you don't think it's too rude. But a lot of people expect in a political leader to have a certain appeal and draw factor. We often talk about charisma. Do you have any? Well, I thought it was important to have charisma in the TV interviewing business, too. So <laughs> What's I, that supposed you know, to mean? <laughs> what would you say if I asked you that question? Funny thing you should ask, though, because uh, I was talking to Earl McCurdy there two days ago at Memorial. They have uh, a fear for, you know, the the students there who have booths and are right. trying to attract and enlist people to sign up for this. You weren't seeking charisma advice from Earl McCurdy, were you? Well, no, as a, since you brought it up, I asked Curl, Earl if he could give me some lessons. <laughs> I also said to Earl, uh, look, Earl, it's a pity you're retiring because he's a bit older than I am, right? That way, if some interviewer like Anthony Germain asked me, aren't you too old for politics, I could point to you. I wasn't going to go there. I wasn't going to go there. So what's next for you? When will you finally make a decision? Do you have a timeline because you've been traveling, you've got your website, 
As far as I know, you're the only person who's really got his toes dipped into the Conservative leadership race. Mm. When, wh what's your timeline? Well, uh, Anthony, on that, I've been to uh, three quarters of the districts around the province, including all the districts in Labrador. Uh, as you would know, these are this is a pretty far-flung province, and yeah. it's not necessarily easy to get into the various nooks and crannies. So, uh, you're right. I've been doing my homework. It's like Woody Allen said, right? Half of success is just being there. True. Well, when you're doing this kind of work, you do need to be there. And one of the great advantages is also uh, to see parts of the province I haven't seen before, but also uh, to get an overview of how the economy of the but various regions the works. The question was, what's your timeline? When are you going to decide? Uh, well, one of my objectives was to decide on that and possibly announce when I'd been to all 40 districts. How many to go? Ten. Ten. All right, we'll keep uh, an eye on your travels. Chess Crosby, thank you very much. Thank you, Anthony. Well, one other fact about Chess Crosby, he also enjoys yoga, but he's not the only one. In St. John's, the SPCA is holding kitten yoga nights, where adoptable cute little kittens roam around the studio and hopefully find their way into somebody's heart. Yes, this could be the world's cutest story. Here now's Zach Gowdy takes us there. Rising up on your breath in. Bring your left hand behind your hip. Stretch your right arm across. You're gonna follow the horizon across to the right. Exhale, sit a little bit lower. Watch out for little kittens behind you as you sink your hips back towards your heels. Hi, I'm Laura Beth Power. I've been teaching kitten yoga for about a year and a half now. The kittens definitely add an extra distraction to the practice. I mean, not that we need any more distractions in our yoga practice, but they add a playfulness and a joyfulness that sometimes a very serious yoga class may be lacking. And when that kitten comes up and brushes against your arm, like you're with it, you're, you're feeling that moment and that is being present. It's, you're not thinking about anything else when that kitten is sitting on your lap while you're doing a forward fold. Our whole motto, be in the meow, be in the now. We've been doing these cat yogas now for about, uh, I'd say a little over a year. We've been really successful with doing them um, to the point where it sells out just about every time. <laughs> It really helps with, you know, not just being in the meow, um, but really hoping to find these kittens' homes really at the end as well. Well, I guess when you're at the shelter, you don't necessarily um, get to see what the cat's personalities are like. Sometimes they're stressed, sometimes they, you know, they are spending time in the cage. But when they come in here and they really get to kind of hang around and just be kittens, um, you really get to see what their true nature is and what they're going to be like in a home and how they're going to act with your kids or things like that. They always say yoga is a lot about mindfulness and you definitely have to be mindful when you're doing kitten yoga because there might be a kitten under you at any given time. And it's okay if you're at home and you can't do a pose and you fall down on your butt, but here you don't want to fall on a kitten, so you have to be very mindful, but it's very adorable. I think that there should be kittens in all aspects of our lives, like office kitten. <laughs> you think you might uh, take one home this evening? Uh, I'd like to take them all home. <laughs> Being a Kingsman is more than the clothing we wear or the weapons we bear. It's about being willing to sacrifice for the greater good. A big budget sequel managed to bump the highest grossing horror film of all time from the top spot at the box office. Kingsman, the Golden Circle, was golden at the box office. The action-packed spy sequel debuted at number one in its opening weekend. After two weekends on the top, the uh, horror flick It fell to second.
Let's meet our young athlete of the day. Today, it would be this talented athlete from the Ghouls. This is Josh Power. Yes, Josh is 15 years old and has been playing soccer since he was four. Is he not quite look 15 to you? I'm not <laughs> sure about that. He looks a bit younger. He plays for the under 15 Fieldians soccer team and uh, under 15 Newfoundland team. Josh has uh, his sights set on playing professional soccer in the future. Way to go, Josh. You're our young athlete of the day. So we were talking, <laughs> but it, it, he does look youthful. <laughs> but anyway, we were we were talking, we were, maybe he was five. Maybe, maybe there was just a, you know, a slight a, yeah. problem there. Uh, we'll anyway, <laughs> when we were last talking to you about the weather, we were talking about you know, transition to mm -hmm. fall. It's up and down the temperature. It's way up in Toronto. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> yeah, everyone it in is. Ontario is complaining about oh, how yeah. hot it is. Yeah, I've been speaking with some of my friends who are just like sitting by the air conditioner. It is so sweltering hot there, but mm -hmm. uh, not so much here. But tomorrow's going to be nice. Let's just have a quick look at uh, current temperatures across Canada. So we're at nine degrees right now in St. John's. Quite the difference to Toronto, Montreal in the 30s. So things are really, really warm in that neck of the woods. Even Halifax right now is sitting at 21 degrees. Cooler as you go west, but still double digits up there in Whitehorse and Yellowknife. So we are keeping an eye on Maria. As I mentioned earlier, we're not expecting to feel any of Maria. It's going to stay nice uh, to the south of us uh, on Saturday here. You can see all the different tracks that it could be taking. But uh, Environment Canada is saying that they're not expecting that we will feel any of it, not in terms of precipitation, not in terms of winds. So it's kind of a non-factor for us at this point. So this is what we're looking at tomorrow. As I mentioned earlier, very nice warm temperatures, 20 degrees in St. John. Some morning showers should clear off in the afternoon. And with the Humidex, it could feel more like 25 degrees. So nice and warm right across the island. Chance of those morning showers with things should clear off as well in Lab City. Some morning showers could happen there and that'll clear off in the day but much much cooler there they have a northerly wind that's keeping things cool and we are going to have a lovely southwesterly wind that will last just for tomorrow <laughs> so uh, Tuesday afternoon you can see those winds that's keeping things uh, nice and warm for us uh, those showers will will move away Tuesday evening you can see some patchy showers on the island there but nice and clear for uh, most of Labrador looking ahead to Wednesday morning another system will be making its way towards uh, Labrador and look at this. This is the snow rain mix that I mentioned a bit earlier. That's Wednesday afternoon. So yeah, it's going to be a bit chilly there. Uh, Lab City there, six degrees. Going to start off with a, a mix of sun and cloud, but then that uh, snow rain mix could move in later on in the day. Cool along the coast, eight degrees there with mostly cloudy skies on the island. We're looking at uh, mostly cloudy skies on uh, Wednesday. So 11 degrees in St. John's on, uh, on Wednesday. So quite the difference from the 20 degree to the 11 degree day and cool uh, right across uh, the island there. And that's that change of winds that's, uh, that's doing that. So Wednesday evening into the overnight hours, you can see all of this rain that's gonna be moving across the island. Uh, the South Coast will see some of that as well. So, and more of that snow rain mix there for Thursday for Lab City, Happy Valley, Goose Bay moving towards the coast. So it's going to be chilly. It's going to be wet and you could see some flurries there. So not so nice. And just look at this, all of this <laughs> rain that's just attacking the island on Thursday morning. We don't know yet quite what the amounts will be. Uh, it's a little too early for that, but it will be a wet day. So temperatures not too bad in the mid, uh, mid double digits, the mid teens there cooler in Labrador with low single digits there and we do have some wet weather moving in on the weekend you can see here things cool down significantly from Tuesday on and Monday some sunshine moving back in but still very cool very crisp and Saturday here for a uh, uh, Happy Valley Goose Bay, 10 degrees, mix of sun and cloud. And then the snow rain mix you can see just lasts for Western Labrador there with some cool temperatures. Debbie? Thanks, Carolyn. Well, turning to international news, rescuers in Mexico City have recovered the body of a woman trapped inside the rubble of a collapsed school. The body was found on the second floor of an elementary school. The building collapsed during last week's earthquake. The latest victim brings the number of dead from the school to 26. 
11 children were pulled out alive. Emergency crews say the search and rescue operation will continue until it is confirmed that no one alive or dead remains under the school's rubble. Well, the U.S. president is refusing to take any criticism in the great football controversy. Donald Trump has called on NFL owners to fire any player who refuses to stand while the national anthem is played. About 200 NFL players staged some sort of protest before their games yesterday. Many took the knee. It's the new term for kneeling during the anthem. It started last year as a protest against the way police treat black people. In a tweet today, Donald Trump said kneeling Kneeling has nothing to do with race. It is about respect for our country, flag, and national anthem. Welcome back to Here and Now. A new Star Trek show hit the airwaves last night, more than 10 years since the last series ended. The Klingon Empire has been in disarray for generations. Boldly going where they've been a couple times before, Star Trek Discovery takes place a decade before Captain Kirk and Spock's adventures on the USS Enterprise. And early reviews suggest the show may live long and prosper. Excited about that. <laughs> that story has longevity, doesn't it? It does, and there's a reason. I was named after a character on Star Trek. Oh, really? Yes, I come from a Trekkie family, yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <laughs> well, the, we have just enough time to end on this beautiful shot of this bird of prey swooping in on those fish, probably caught during the food fishery on the weekend. And this is uh, sent to us from Fred Woodmond of New Harbor Point. Oh, Fred, Beautiful who shot. owns a fish plant. He's been a long time in the business. That is a nice shot. Beautiful shot. So thank you very much, Fred, for uh, sending that up to Ryan's Facebook page. Well, and that's it for us tonight. Yeah. Thanks so much for joining us. Good night. See you tomorrow.